When we first heard that somebody or other was going to dig some holes in the landfill, we just knew we were going to have to be there. Gee, old smelly garbage from a long time ago. Who could pass up playing in that? Well, we certainly got what we came for, and a whole lot more. This is a document of the things we saw and the people we met. Wilson Hughes and Bill Rafje came up. They're the co-directors of Project Garbage. And we, uh, Apparently, the idea of digging in a landfill caught the fancy of a lot of folks. This is a sign of the coming times, a press conference on top of a 100-foot mound of garbage. Fortunately, most of the lightweights fled about the time the first good bucketful came out of the hole. See, there's a tad of a smell attached to this operation. With the formalities out of the way, it was about time to find out who these people really were and what the heck they were up to. Lesson one in garbology is to meet Bill Rathje. When I was, when I was about eight years old, my uh, grandparents gave me a golden book of archaeology, and I fell in love with archaeology, you know, temples and palaces and burials and jungles and raiders of the lost ark and all that kind of stuff. And now all I do is dig into modern garbage. When I became a professor at the University of Arizona, uh, I began teaching undergraduates, and I wanted them to understand that archaeology is just looking at the relationship between patterns and artifacts and patterns and behavior. Because really, that's all archaeologists do. And so I sent them out into modern Tucson to look at patterns in, in both. And a couple of the students came back with garbage. And they wanted to see if the patterns in the garbage from different neighborhoods was the kinds of patterns that they would expect. And it wasn't. So all of a sudden, it became very interesting to me what we could learn about ourselves and about what we eat and what we uh, throw away, what we recycle, hazardous waste, etc. We could learn that by looking at our garbage. Well, the reason we're here in Toronto is, is partly to see what the difference is overall between Canadian garbage and U.S. garbage, which I think is, is very interesting because, you know, in the U.S., we say we throw away the most garbage per person. And up here in Canada, I've been shocked to find that Canadians say they throw away the most garbage. So it's sort of a, a battle of the garbage mongers. You know, who does throw away the most garbage? But the real issue, the real reason we're here is that in Toronto, for the last five years and longer, in various parts, there's been a very effective blue box curbside recycling program. And in the United States now, and elsewhere in Canada, a lot of people are starting these programs, and they want to know what kind of impact is that going to have on their landfills? Is that going to have on their solid waste management? And by doing a study of pre-blue box and post-blue box garbage in these landfills, we're going to be able to give them the answer. Well, what is actually going on is we get a, we get a totally accurate measurement as to how deep we are taking this core sampling from. We do a temperature test of the mass to find out you know, what temperature it is you know, because temperature is directly related to activity. And then we, uh, we categorize it and analyze roughly where everything was. We, we shovel it up into buckets, then we take it to a rough screen to take out the, you know, the larger particles, and then we put it into various bags. All those, remember, this is just sample gathering right now. I mean, right now it's just sort of a frenzy. Bucket auger is a very, very expensive piece of equipment. <laughs> very expensive. So you want to get your work done with him really fast, and then over the next, so this will be going on, it's about three days per landfill. And we'd like to get about 20, 30 samples from each landfill at different levels. And then we'll take that back to the Recycling Development Corporation's uh, analytical warehouse facility, and we will break it down into smaller components at that point and do various tests there. There is not been a single bucket load we've taken out that hasn't had newspapers in it. And what we do is the newspapers give us the immediate date, uh, and, but you don't know if somebody's hung that around their garage for six months or whatever. So we look at bottles, we look at caps, we look at... This, this usually labels on a lot of things in there that you can find. It's pretty easy to find out what dates of stuff is, actually. It's really quite remarkable what you can find in people's waste. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Mother. Thank you <laughs> Still fascinated with the whole idea of candid garbage, we followed what came out of the hole to Recycling Development Corporation's back room. On reflection, it's amazing. Here's all this stuff. It was flung into a garbage can, flung into a garbage truck, compacted there, 
compacted at a garbage transfer station, dumped in the landfill, and compacted again, hauled out by the bucket auger. Now it's being handled, studied, and classified as if it were precious ancient artifacts. And, it, and he's lost his little leggy. Of course, our spirit would be in the garbage. Who else, right? He lives in the garbage can. <laughs> Isn't he cute? Diaper? Do we have diapers yet? No, no. And the basic categories are uh, roofing material, ferrous metal, mm, paper in general, uh, paper that's packaging, textiles, mm, clay. There's a lot of that in the landfill. Diapers, mm -hmm. rocks, yard waste. Oh, polystyrene. Ooh, it doesn't look so pretty in the landfill. Press board stuff in this bin. A highly scientific category here of rubber stuff. And milled wood. Uh, so far, just a popsicle stick and a half. This is the stuff we saw falling through the screen at the landfill. Holy smokes, archaeologists are picky. This is the type of thing that we'll be doing at the University of Toronto in one of the physical, I mean, one of the archaeology labs. What will they be looking for at UT? Uh, we will just be doing exactly the same thing as we've been doing with the larger material, sorting it according to uh, various categories like paper, glass, ferrous, metal, aluminum, wood, and then getting a weight measurement as well as a volume. Some of the stuff when it came to the screen, it was still surrounded by a clay or dirt matrix. So we get clumps of it, which we then have to break and see if there's anything else in there. Sometimes you'll find bits and pieces of glass or just rock. We can see the definite progression, the change in the packaging, certainly. I mean, we went to, uh, there's newspapers and glass in 1950, and there's newspapers and glass in 1990. Uh, there's not a lot of plastic in 1950. In fact, there's very little plastic. And you find a lot of that now, plastic film, uh, rigid plastic, uh, you know, items like a sprinkler hose handle, a golf bag, um, you know, a lot of dolls. Uh, which we see in, this, in, the, in the material now that you don't see in any, any of the 1950 stuff. You know, when they made a, a brass or a stainless steel hose nozzle, I mean, that was one you had for, for the whole time you had a garden, you know. And now they make these cheap ones out of plastic, and you might use them for a couple of years, and, you know, the, the fight against sprinkler. I think my dad has bought 400 sprinklers in the last three years because they're all cheap plastic things. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the most interesting thing about digging in the landfill and that I want to tell people is that um, the landfill, what we see in there, is just a big pile of our natural resources that were used once or twice and dropped in this big hole. And some of, them are degra some of it's degrading, some of it isn't degrading. That's not the, the real issue. I mean, we know that it's fairly safe in there. The issue is, why are we using this stuff at such a high rate? And why are we just throwing it away? Uh, I've got to tell you something, okay? I mean, we are de definitely a wasteful society. I mean, our wasteful patterns and habits are clearly observable in every landfill we've been involved in. Uh, we drink too much, we consume too much, we just do too much basically of everything and we have to move to a conservative society. I mean, we just have to. There aren't, you know, landfills are filling up, nobody wants them around anymore and we're just wasting very good materials. I find it totally offensive, frankly. I mean, Bill Rafchie has discovered that 9% of residential waste stream is whole, perfectly good food that we bought and then threw away. We have 120,000 people a month in, in, in Toronto going to food banks. So we throw away food and we have hungry people. It's totally offensive to me. I think the most critical discovery in the, in the garbage project history, the 18 years, is what we found in virtually every study. <clears throat> and that is that we're a very schizophrenic society. We know what the right thing to do is, <clears throat> what the right things to eat are, what the right thing to recycle is, etc. But we also know what's easier and what we like and so forth. And we do sort of a mix of things. So instead of getting a bag of garbage that has just Mrs. Nutter's 29 grain high fiber good for you bread, in the same bag of garbage, you're going to find a hostess Twinkie. And a lot of people think that, that that's a, a big source of confusion. What I think is it's reality. And if we understood that better, if we accepted that better and realized that we all do a little of what's good and a little of what's bad, and that the reality is a mix, I think we'd come to a much more valuable understanding that would allow for us to make a better contribution to the environment. You know, we can't recycle everything. 
But if all of us recycle all that we can, we can all make a really big difference. A question came up around the office.